Hello everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Portia Summers and I am the constituent liaison at the district office of um, assembly member Khalil Anderson. Um, this topic is very dear to me considering the amount of African-American or black women that are affected or impacted by um, in the healthcare system. I just gonna start off by introducing um, everyone. I'll start with Dr. Clover Hutchison. Thank you, Ms. Hutchison for joining. Thank you for having me. Would you mind just uh, telling us a little about yourself, where you're from? All right, so my name is Clover Hutchinson and I am an occupational therapist. I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Um, 25 of those years I spent as a manager at Brookdale Hospital in Brooklyn. And I just transitioned from being in the, a clinician to being an academic. So I now am a full-time um, assistant professor at York College in the Occupational Therapy Program. And I live here in St. Albans. <laughs> Thank you. Why, why did you leave Brookdale? I'm just curious. I'm familiar with that. Well, you know what it is? I, it's, it's 25 years in the clinician, and I've, I've been adjuncting for almost 12 or 13 years, and I felt like the time was right. I, I wanted to now, um, you know, pivot to make an impact on learning, you know, producing qualified um, clinicians in occupational therapy with a specific goal in really reaching or impacting Black students. Um, to enter the field. I'm also the president of the New York State Black Occupational Therapy Caucus. So I'm really passionate about, you know, Black being in the health profession, be successful when they get to school and being a role model and just seeing that, you know, we're there, you know, we're in the field also. Thank you. Our next panelist is Ms. Brooke Smith. Hello. Hello. How are you? I would just like for you to introduce yourself just to let people know who you are and um, what organization you represent. Yes. Um, my name is Brooke Smith. I am the co-founder of the Baby Resource Center. We are a nonprofit organization and we help families through birth and loss. Thank you. Our next panelist is Dr. Sharon Rumley. Hello, Dr. Rumley. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. It's a pleasure to meet you. Finally. I know. Um, can you just give us uh, just a brief description of who you are and what you do? Okay, I'm Dr. Sharon Rumley. I'm the Executive Director at the Queens Comprehensive Perinatal Council, a community-based maternal child health organization 32 years in the community. We provide case management, home visiting, uh, consumer and provider education. And more recently, we have been funded to implement a secondary teen pregnancy prevention program. It's the Teen Support Project. And that is a mission that's dear to my heart. My dissertation addressed this issue. And so I'm seeing it come to fruition. And we're working in Jamaica, Southeast Queens, and on the Rockaway Peninsula, uh, communities that have the highest incidence of teen births in the borough of Queens. But I'll talk about that a little later. Thank you so much. And next we have Dr. Edgar, Edgar Mandeville. Hello, Dr. Mandeville. How Thank are you? you? Glad to be here. I am an obstetrician gynecologist. I uh, spent my whole life in Queens. I uh, was chairman. Uh, I had private practice in Queens for several decades. I was uh, chairman of the Department of OBGYN at Harlem Hospital from 2006 to 2017. Mm -hmm. I am currently um, uh, a visiting professor and advisor to the chair of OBGYN at SUNY Downstate. And uh, for 25 years, I was uh, 
board chair of the Arthur Ashe Institute, and I am still a board member. Impressive. That is so. Thank you. And next we have Dr. Marilyn Frazier. Hello, Dr. Frazier. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Marilyn Fraser. I'm the CEO of the Arthur Ashe Institute for Urban Health. Uh, the Institute was founded by Arthur Ashe just a few minute, moments before he died, a few months. And I have served as a CEO for about five years. Now we are located at SUNY Downstate Medical Center. I serve as a co-director of the Brooklyn Health Disparity Center as well as uh, the associate research professor in both the Department of Medicine and the School of Public Health at SUNY Downstate. And I have the pleasure of having Dr. Mandeville be our chair emeritus of, our, our, of the board of the Arthur Ashe Institute. So a lot of our work centers around health disparities, health inequities, and addressing those issues within our communities that um, affect us um, disproportionately, including maternal morbidity and mortality. So I'm really happy to be a part of this conversation this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And we can start our conversation. Oh, I'm sorry. It's your assembly member, Chantel Jackson, the people's social worker and proud advocate for Black maternal health and justice. I'm a proud mom of two, TJ being my youngest, who is now eight months. Uh, I remember when I was pregnant with him, one of the fears I had was not living through the process, dying at childbirth. Why? Because I saw a number of black moms not make it to see their children, to hold their children. And I am a, a love and fan of Serena Williams, one of the strongest women I know. And I even watched her go through what number of us black women have to go through. And that's the healthcare system discriminating towards us just because of the color of our skin, the belief that we uh, don't feel pain. All those things happen. And that's why I advocate strongly for black moms to make sure that we all get to hold our children at the end and we get to have access to resources. All right, so that was our dear colleague in state assembly government, uh, Assemblywoman Chantel Jackson uh, from District 79 over in the Bronx. Uh, so thank you to Team Jackson uh, and thank you to the Assemblywoman for providing that video. Uh, and my name is Carl Valer. I proudly serve as Chief of Staff to New York State Assemblyman Khalil M. Anderson. I'll be offering additional support, uh, but we're really excited for tonight's conversation about Black maternal health and reproductive justice. Uh, and so without further ado, uh, let's get into our discussion. Uh, we're starting with the Arthur Ashe Institute. Um, uh, Dr. Frazier, can you talk about your role at Arthur Ashe? Um, and if you could also just sort of share what are the women's health resources uh, and services provided by the Institute? Okay, sure, sure. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the Arthur Ashe Institute being founded by Arthur Ashe, and he recognized that there were health inequities, and, and, and unfortunately, those still exist, and COVID has highlighted a lot of the things that we already knew were underlying conditions that, that promote certain health issues. Uh, the Institute has been focused on addressing health disparities by going into the community and training barbers and training stylists so that they can deliver health messages to their customers. And we have done that in terms of looking at health uh, within, within our community. We have done that with breast cancer programs for women where we have trained here stylists, salon stylists to deliver health messages to their customers and to see whether the, the stylist delivered messages uh, change 
behaviors of those customers. We do that through cardiovascular disease. We have a heart of a woman program and we look at heart disease in women and, and look at their risk factors and making sure people know their numbers. So talking about blood pressure, talking about uh, different things as cholesterol, cholesterol numbers, knowing what your BMI may be. Because we recognize that that without education, without health promotion, we will not be able to move the, the needle forward. Also, we train young people and train young women. And so they, they learn about reproductive health in, in our Health Science Academy, which is an after school science enrichment program for students that are interested in the health professions. More recently, in addressing health disparities and looking at maternal health and maternal uh, morbidity and mortality, we have collaborated with Downstate's OBGYN department to develop a women's health cab. And the Women's Health Community Advisory Board looks at health issues across the spectrum. And we have started with OBGYN issues and looking specifically at maternal morbidity and mortality. And what we have done there is to create a multidisciplinary team to address that, that issue. So we have folks that are nurses and, and, and midwives and OB and OBGYNs, as well as individuals that are doulas and community members that are working on perinatal health. And, and these folks have come together to, to talk about maternal health and even to talk about people's experiences and talk about patient experiences within the system and within um, healthcare. Uh, one of the things that have risen to the top, so so to speak, is training the next generation and training other obstetricians and gynecologists so that people would uh, be more culturally sensitive to a certain extent or, or more sensitive to the needs of the community that, that we serve. We are located within Brooklyn and we serve a large African American, Afro-Caribbean community. So making sure that we are we understand uh, the different things that people may face and different challenges within our communities when we are addressing healthcare. So the Institute has been doing this work now for almost 30 years. We're in our 30th year and we are, we are trying to make sure that we are shifting the, the needle, but we know that policies need to change and systems need to be dismantled. So a lot of our work also centers around advocacy and centers around working with policymakers so that we can make those changes. Uh, quick question, Dr. Frazier. I uh, just really quick. Um, I know I should wait until the end to ask questions, but you mentioned policies that you think should be changed in order to help um, better assist people in our community that are affected. Um, can you name one specifically? So yes, when we think about uh, the, the policies that are within our community, when we think about the things, when we look at socioeconomic status, and unfortunately, when we think about women that are bright women, women that are definitely uh, sometimes at a higher socioeconomic uh, status, they're very well educated, of course, and we see that and black women, and we see that their their morbidity from maternal health is um at, is lower than that of of someone that's uneducated and 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 maybe a different race or be maybe a white woman. And so we wonder, okay, what else is going on within our communities that are causing those things, right? So one of the things that we know that there is racism. We 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 know that that there are racist policies within um communities. I really applaud our former commissioner of health um, in, in New York City, who now is at the state, uh, Mary Bassett. When she was at the Department of Health, she uh, made sure that there were classes in terms of undoing racism. And, and, and people had to take that to understand that there are racist practices, there are biases um, within healthcare, and we need to address those things. So one policy is to address racism. Uh, another policy is to make sure that there are equitable access to care uh, for people within our communities, whether we are, uh, have to address immigration issues, whether we have to address the insurance issues. So insurance policies, making sure that there's insurance for everyone. Everyone should be insured. Everyone should have health care. So health care should not be a luxury or a benefit. It should be a right. So those are some of the policies. I know you asked for one, but uh, those are some of the ones that I could think of. 
off the top of my head. No, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's, um, it's refreshing to hear, you know, the truth, especially from someone that is on the front lines and I have seen it all. So thank you so much. Welcome. Dr. Mandeville. Hello. I would just like to ask yes. you. So I would just like to ask you um, a question or two. Or sure. Three. Okay. Um, what are the women's health services provided? Um, the services that are provided, did you see a difference with the services that you guys provided before, like from before they started providing the services and up to now? Like, have you seen a major impact? What, what what services are you are you speaking of? So the services that um, Off the Ash provides, the institute provides for women. Uh, we can. Uh, there are any number. I thought you were talking about more societal issues, uh, but certainly the Arthur Ash Institute, uh, as being the major instit healthcare institute within Central Brooklyn, has a role. And, uh, and, and Central Brooklyn, with its large Black and Caribbean, Af African-American and Afro-Caribbean population, is, uh, is the epicenter of the, the metaphor that Dr. Frazier was talking about. Uh, we see all of the issues that impact Black women and, its, and morbidity and mortality relative to their reproductive circumstances. We see uh, ridiculously high BMIs. We see uh, comorbidities like diabetes, and we see uh, uh, any number of other issues which impact the terrible numbers that Dr. Frazier was talking about. We have yet to figure out specifically why a woman, a Black woman, who in Harlem, where I used to be the chairman of the department, uh, can own a four million dollar brownstone and have the have a worse maternal mortality than the white woman who is who cleans her house and sits next to her on the subway train, and in addition to those in Central Brooklyn who are more financially challenged, we're working on a lot of those issues. A lot of those issues are very obvious, but on a larger level, since we're talking to the legislative people. There are other issues that have to do with our concern on a larger level having to do with the, the threat to women uh, writ large by the changes in the Supreme Court, which obviously the politicians have a, have a role in, because my career spanned the pre-abortion era, and, uh, and that may come back to haunt us if some of the inclinations of the right-wing majority come to pass. There are other issues that are around contraception and, ac and accessibility of women's health care. Thank you for speaking. You got nailed. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mandeville. That is an extremely uh, sensitive topic. Thank you for touching on that. I to so, deal with the sensitivity the, the, the sensitivity of those issues has to be looked at because i'll just give you some, some quick examples uh one of the things that we know is that women's ability through access to health care affects not only themselves but their progeny because women are the central part of the family network. And if in fact they can't control their reproductive issues, problems begin. And I think that one of the, at Harlem, I'll give you a quick example. At Harlem, one of the, when I was working for Health and Hospitals Corporation, we tried to get as open and obvious and uh, an accessible access to 
uh, contraception for those who wanted it. And yet we had other people who were equally motivated for black women who thought that those processes amounted to genocide. So there are philosophical distance differences within the same community, both on uh, who on both sides of the spectrum are in favor of making healthcare better for black people. So there are a lot of issues that we have to deal with within as well as without the community. That is absolutely true. Thank you so much. Um, I would love to keep going, but I'm going to introduce the next panelist. I can go on all night on that topic. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. So um, the next question is for Ms. Dr. Shamron Rumley. What are some of the resources offered by QCPC that aim to reduce the in incidence of infant and maternal mortality and adolescent pregnancy? Unmute. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. We can hear you now. You can? Yes. Good. Yeah. I think as described previously, our core services, case management, home visiting, um, consumer education is what is needed at the grassroots level to impact on giving women of childbearing age who are at risk access to different services, linking them and making referrals, doing the follow-up, all of that is critical. And I can't stress how case management is such a core service and how we are able to um, empower the women that we work with. And we're seeing that in our adolescent population also. Um, we have Black and Hispanic adolescents who are participating in our current teen support project. And they come with a multitude of psychosocial issues that you have to begin to address before you can see them moving toward meeting what we want to see as their empowerment goals, um, completing their academic programming, um, adhering to birth control um, and reproductive health planning. Um, it's a challenge, but a committed professional staff in wanting to see the participants success is is critical um i think that's how i'll leave that for now i think again having a committed staff who is willing to work with the challenges that our clients experience. Um, we're going to be working on the Rockaway Peninsula and working with the resident association presidents of the NYSHA facility. And I've reached out to them and explained the program and they're wanting to meet with the staff so we can start the promotion of the services in the community and having individuals who are comfortable in being able to do that, being accepting. And I tell staff, you have to be non-judgmental. They'll come with problems that may seem over your understanding, but a willingness to meet them where they are and take them from Point A to point Z is what we have to commit to. So I think that's where we've been successful. Thank you so much. Um, uh, just one last question for you, Dr. Rumley. What have been, and you did mention this, you touched on it, but I just want to ask the question. Um, what have been some of the impacts of QCPC's work in Southeast Queens and how have 
how can people get involved um, with the work of QCPP? Well, we're going to be establishing, and we've had in the past, collaborations where we've had coalitions that have a cross-section of providers and key stakeholders. And seeing that target population as one that we want to support collectively. And so we're now going to be launching in June a teen pregnancy and parenting advisory coalition. And we'll be sending out invites to those individuals that we have identified as key stakeholders as well as providers. And the providers are extremely excited about it because we don't want to have overlapping um, coordination. We want to coordinate so that all of our resources are there and we can have this provider network that recognizes all of the strengths that we all bring to the table. And in that way, we're able to successfully support uh, the teen moms. So I was very interested in hearing about the baby resource um, that was mentioned earlier, because we're looking at all kinds of uh, programs that will support teen moms. Okay. Um, and we'll definitely hear from Ms. Brooke Lugo. Um, my next question is, and thank you, Dr. Rumley, so much for um, your question, uh, answering the questions and um, okay. the something that you're doing. I know we are expecting you at our office soon. And I'm yes. Uh, yes. So next thank week. You so much. Yep. <laughs> um, the next question is for panelist Dr. Clover Hutchison. Um, what is an occupational therapist? Because most people don't know. Um, so thank you. Looking to think we're, we're we're over a hundred years in the field and we're still um, being asked what is OT. <laughs> um, so occupational therapy is a um, part of the health profession. We're licensed health healthcare workers, and um, so we work with clients who have various challenges, whether it's physical or mental. And our goal is for them to be able to participate in activities that they need to or activities that they want to. And in our field, we call those activities occupation. And we want them to, to, to resume or to be meaningfully engaged in activities that they want to. So that's where we come in. And it's, it's kind of nice because we, we have many different niche areas. You know, we're in the schools, we're in the hospitals, we're in the communities. Uh, we are in industry-based stuff in terms of ergonomics. Um, so, you know, we, we do have our hand and little feet in, in, in a lot of areas. Um, typically, people see us as a part of what we call the rehab team. So in the hospitals, you'll see us working with, say, OTPTs in speech, but um, we're not tethered to them. We do um, work on our own. And the key difference between us and PT really is that um, we're licensed to address um, mental health issues. And, and that's huge and very necessary. Um, and oftentimes get overlooked, especially in our community. Um, my next question is, what is the role of occupational therapists in maternal health and wellness? So, I mean, we have multiple roles. And like I said earlier, we talked about, you know, what are these occupations that the moms or moms to be need and want to um, accomplish. So we can be involved in both the prenatal stage and the postpartum stage. So, you know, so we can work on in the prenatal stage, just how, you know, what, what do moms complain the most about? You know, can they, they can't sleep well. So we can work with them on positioning or creating what we call sleep hygiene, um, ways in which they can get more restful sleep. Okay. I mean, anyone can sleep, but if not restful, it's definitely no help to our bodies. So we can make recommendations about how to get into bed, how to get out of bed, how to position yourself while in bed. You know, we don't necessarily say go buy expensive um, items. You can use things within your home. So for example, women often complain when sitting in bed that their backs hurt 
So we could encourage them if they're going to maintain a, a long sitting position in bed to put a pillow under the knees. If they're going to sleep on the side, which is often the position most recommended, we can have them preferably sleep on the left side. But, you know, tell them to put a pillow between their leg, a pillow by the knees, as well as to support the, the stomach. Now, in the postpartum stage, one of the things that we always see a lot is the moms who come in and they complain about um, um, cumulative trauma or rep repetitive stress disorders, if you will. So they'll complain about having pains in the thumb, numbness and tingling in the hand. And that come from that can come about from how they're holding or managing their babies. So we can suggest, you know, the, the head is the biggest part of the baby. Don't rest that head on your 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 wrist by your thumb, because that's gonna cause initial problems. Um, use larger muscles, you know, rather than try to hold the baby with just your hands, maybe you want to support the baby on a pillow where you you use um, the larger muscles versus the smaller muscles which are easily fatigued. Um, we also you know, try to give, um, think of resources, you know, um, some moms don't have the support. There's some who do have the support, but don't utilize the support. We, we try to encourage them to do that. Um, we also kind of guide them in this new role, you know, some of this, the transitions that they have to make, you know, you've been a new mom or a mom in general, you know, do you delegate, you know, how are you going to navigate those transitions to get back to work? You know, those are things that we can have a conversation with the um, with with mom, and of course, we also take a community look. One of the things we teach our students in OT school is what's community access like. You know, um, can the mom get on the bus, the train, um, into the stores? You know, how can they navigate those stuff? So we have conversations about how to truly um, navigate the environment, and then. Well, the last thing I would talk about is that we we also talk about feeding. Now, as a therapist, you know, originally when I was in the hospital, we were a part of the NICU team. So we had those premature babies who, you know, if, if they're born 26 weeks or less of gestation age, they don't have their suck pads. They, they can't, you know, they're not um, having adequate intake. So we would be there to work on, you know, non-nutritive or nutritive that kind of feed for them to help them latch onto the bottle, you know, latch onto the breast and so forth. We teach moms how to hold the baby to maximize um, positioning to help um, feeding and so forth. So, you know, we're, we're in many aspects of it. We don't work alone oft most of the times. So we do work with nursing. And so, you know, we're part of a team in general. You play a huge part. Yeah. All of those things when I have my kids. Thank you so much. And um, I'm going to our panelist, Ms. Brooke Lugo Smith, the co founder of the Baby Resource Center. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about? I know I asked before, but just um, give me a little bit, um, a little information on why you started the Baby Resource Center. What was the need you saw? Most definitely. Thank you so much for offering the opportunity for us to share. And um, I can definitely start off with a glimpse of our personal story. Um, in 2014, during my ninth month of pregnancy, I had electively reported to the labor and delivery department of our hospital on three separate occasions. I complained of decreased fetal movement over like a four week period of time. And each time we were sent home with basic testing um, of our daughter's heart rate, movement, even comments that um, our baby was just lazy. And unfortunately, on that thir third visit, just six days after our last attempt for help, we were told that our daughter, Kennedy Grace Smith, had no heartbeat. Um, we were not set down with options. We were not given resources. We were told to go home without any guidance of what would happen next. And we even begged to have an emergency C-section, but we were told that they couldn't risk um, my life for a dead fetus. So. All these rushed and uninformed decisions with no support from, from the hospital, hospital, it really led us and, and, and guided us to our passion um, to start the Baby Resource Center. Um, soon after we learned that it wasn't just our story and one in four women were losing their babies. Um, and we started the nonprofit organization to help pregnant families. So we wanted to be proactive with educational workshops 
free doula services and supporting families also who have pregnancy and infant losses by paying for burials, cremations, peer support groups. And we also host um, New York City's annual awareness of walk over the Brooklyn Bridge. And um, even more so, um, we realized that the doctors, the staff, I mean, there's just like a lack of accurate and comprehensive data and, and resources for stillbirth in, in the US. And we noticed that there was no standard practice put in place at hospitals. And the, and the doctors and the nurses are kind of left to decide what to do on their own. And we would assume that everybody knows to be empathetic. Um, but as social workers, my husband and I, as social workers, it's our job um, to respect the inherent dignity and worth of our clients that we meet. So we just had this idea to implement um, legislation. So we had legislation introduced and we wanted to change um, some of the standards and some of the things that, that were happening. Um, there was a bill, Assembly Bill A7515, which had reached the health committee. And um, we wanted to have this act require um, policies and procedures for dignified and sensitive management of each stillbirth in consultation with nursing and psychology and the social work professionals. We also want the state to establish protocols for evaluating fetal death to ensure doctors and hospitals report accurate and complete data to the state so that eventually there can be a database and there can be more research so that a change can happen. I am deeply touched by that um, and so sorry for your loss. And I'm so glad that the, it drove you to start the Baby Resource Center because it is, I, I keep saying like everything that all of the panelists are doing, everything that everyone is bringing to the table is so important, um, especially within our community. But the Baby Resource Center, that is perfect. Um, and Dr. Rumley, I'm sure you guys will probably speak about this because she said it's something that she was excited to hear about. Um, and I have another question. I have several, but just this last question. Um, what are what can Assembly District 31 residents do to learn more about your organization's work? Um, yes. Definitely. Um, information is online. You can definitely follow us online at the Baby Resource. Um, there wasn't enough characters to say center. So at the Baby Resource, <laughs> um, you can follow us on social media. Um, you can visit our website, um, thebabyresourcecenter.com. And um, you can sign up to our mailing list um, to get publications and, and articles and hear what's happening next. You can come to the walk. Um, more than anything, I think awareness is key. And um, if you know somebody that goes through this, I think what you can do is, is refer them to an organization like mine, um, an organization like, um, the, what is it, the Queen Center for Perinatal, I want to make sure I say it right, QCPC. <laughs> So um, I think it's important to to be a resource. So even if it hasn't happened to you, it might have happened to a loved one, a friend, a sister, just be that resource um, for them and let them know that there is support out there because I don't think there's enough awareness. And I think that's pretty much what, what people can do. Um, aside from that, with the bill, um, it would be amazing if if people rally their friends and family members and let their their elected officials know that this bill is is sitting in a committee and ask them to support it and and help us get it through because um research is key research is key and the statistics you know that are happening in other countries they're doing so much better than the united states when it comes to to infant loss and you would think you know since we aren't um we're, we're a country with so many resources and 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 support that there would be something different going on here in new york but we have about maybe twenty three thousand babies dying every year and with all the technology and resources that we have you can't tell me that we can do better some of these losses are preventable not all are and we know that but some of these are in our instance like i said i was nine months pregnant and um and we ended up finding out that she had an undetected knot in her cord that was also around her neck. So considering that we went in so many times, there, there, were, there were ways that this could have um, played out differently. And as we talk about even maternal 
um, morbidity, it just kind of speaks to how our voices are heard as Black women in 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 the healthcare system. Um, I also like to say that um, there is another act, Shine for Autumn, that actually got introduced into the Senate today, and they are also doing similar work. Um, um, I've actually worked with um, uh, Miss Debbie, who's behind the the bill, um, for years now, and we've e even modeled some of the things that we do um, with her. She's in Jersey, so that's our sis our sister state right there. And um, I'm so happy that it was introduced um, um, to the Senate today. It passed in the House already. So as you know, that's a huge, huge accomplishment. So they want to establish a stillbirth center, and this would be federally. So it's absolutely amazing the work that they're doing. So I would just implore people to contact their elected officials. You may think it doesn't matter, but it matters. They need to hear what we care about, what, what the community cares about, and you know, Black excellence hasn't been spoken higher in any other time period that I know. This is it. This is what we're doing now. And, and we want to help across all platforms, including healthcare and healthcare for our Black women. Thank you so much. Um, I think that that does not sum it up. I have a question. Um, and this is for any panelists. Do you think with new laws um, being implemented, do you think that would really help change the way um, Black women are treated when they're receiving prenatal care, when they're having a baby? Um, this postpartum care, do you think that it would actually help? Do you think it starts in the schools the way our doctors are, our residents are taught, our medical students are taught? I think perhaps with the education and the person that trains them, their chief, um, you know, I think it starts there, but I don't know. Do you think that the legislation will help? Well, I'm not, I don't know specifically about this legislation because unfortunately I don't know what the specifics are. That said, there are certain, there are clearly certain things that can be done on a legislative level, like encouraging and funding doula services uh, because doula services have the unique capacity to be the interface between medicine, community, emotion, family, and, 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 and they oftentimes act as the bridge between the patient and the, and the staff and the hospital staff, as well as the prenatal care staff. But th those are some of the things that can be, we have a very active, uh, doula program at SUNY Downstate, and we are finding that that has. It, it, it's been extremely helpful. We haven't even had the statistics to see if it changes things as yet, but we know certainly that it builds a, a much better rapport, which in and of itself is helpful. Is it in, is the, uh, the doula services, are they accepting insurance? Is it free? Uh, how can our, um, how can people in our community well, I think it, it. We have our own unique way at SUNY of of developing it, but but it has to be hospital by hospital and department by department. But certainly, uh, uh, legislators can have a role in supporting the concept and the implementation of things like doula services. I can speak a little bit to that as well. Um, Currently, people pay out of pocket. There was a pilot program um, that was going around where um, people who have Medicaid might be able to be supplemented. Um, I think part of the problem became what was being offered in um, compensation didn't really offset the work that was being done. Right. There is a lot of, of evidence. Um, they, I, be, I believe there's a company called Evidence Based Birth, and they have some resources and some statistics about um doula services and 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 how they are beneficial and just some evidence-based practice oh, yeah. and no um for those who don't know what doula services are it's a birth supporter um somebody who is there um like dr mandel says in between like i, I would like to say back in the day we used to think that there was only one um doctor um, one OBGYN when you were given birth and you would just get all your answers from that one doctor they were there when you when you need them but that's not the case um, a lot of times people are in a, a practice, doctors coming in and out, you have different appointments with different doctors, they don't really know your full case. 
And um, you kind of just need that one person to lean on, that one person to help gather information. They don't provide medical intervention, just information and resources, but I, it makes such a world of a difference. And a lot of people in, in our um, black and brown community don't even know these resources are there or don't even know that doula services um, exist. You know, it's not really something that's popular. You just kind of go through this um, alone to a certain extent. So um, I too believe that um, supporting um, legislation for doula services and have it right. covered by medical insurance is a very powerful thing to help um, turn around these rates. And, and we need to see it. What, what do we have to lose? We don't want more women to lose their lives during pregnancy. So I believe having a support would only change those numbers for the better. Ms. Summers. Yes. I wanted to mention that the staff are going to be trained to provide doula services. Caribbean Women's Health Association has a training program where we'll be able to offer the free doula services to our client participants. So the staff are just really excited about that, being right. able to provide the emotional and educational support to the teen moms. That's great. Um at what stage do they start the doula services? Is it the first, second, or third? They have birth, and then they have postpartum doula services. Oh, man, that's great. And, so and, 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 and some extensive doula services uh, follow the patient throughout the prenatal care, not just at birth. Oh, wow. Well, that's what I'm... When I say birth, mm. they include the prenatal period. Okay. So it's prenatal through birth, and then the postpartum follow-up as well. Right. Oh, that's beautiful. And I just wanted to get free. back to the, sorry. That's it, free. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to um, touch a little bit on the question you asked about training, right? And training for residents, training for folks that are going into health professions, training for the, the ones that are dealing with, with patients. I think that's really important. And I think that for us to have training of our residents definitely in terms of dealing with the community so that they're cognizant of various things and very various nuances within the community as well and, and knowing the needs of people right uh, dr mandeville mentioned that the community that we serve may be um, is a, a large african-american afro-caribbean community uh, mm -hmm. oftentimes uh, within those communities there are, there are different practices that people need to be aware of the way that uh, people may interact with the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And those things are important for, for folks to know, for, for our residents to know, for our medical students to know. And it's not too early in medical school, it's not too early in occupational therapy uh, school. Uh, it, it's not too early in the health professions um, for, for people to know that before they deal with the patients and so that they could understand that better. So definitely to your question about training, training is needed at all mm -hmm. different levels uh, of the healthcare uh, spectrum. Thank you so much. Um, everyone, I just wanted to introduce the assembly member who's here with us. Hello, assembly member, Hello, Anderson. Hello. Hey, good evening, Hi. everyone. Good evening. So glad to see everybody on the call uh, this evening engaged in uh, what's such a critical discussion. Mm -hmm. When we talk about uh, Black maternal health, when we talk about reproductive justice, we're talking about making sure that we preserve the safety of birth and sexual health mm -hmm. in our communities. And I'm so thankful to my staff, uh, Ms. Summers, uh, and to my chief of staff, Carl Villier, uh, who uh, put together tonight's program with our amazing, amazing panelists to talk about this very key and touchy, in some instances, subject. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you, Dr. Frazier, uh, who is our, the CEO at the R for Ash Institute. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited that y'all will be joining us uh, soon with some other initiatives. So we're going to keep talking about that. I'm really excited that we have Dr. Sharon Rumley, who will be joining us next week. I'm mm -hmm. excited about that because we have a lot of work to do and helping mm -hmm. address some of the disparities around health mm -hmm. uh, and wellness uh, for our mothers uh, and for sexual health in our communities, which is so important, reproductive health in our communities, which is so mm -hmm. critical. I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Hutchinson, um, who does a lot of critical work uh, in occupational therapy, health and wellness uh, at New York College, which is so important. I see my friend, 
uh, and so so gracious supporter, uh, Ms. Brooke, Brooke Lugo Smith, who's the founder of the Baby Resource Center. I'm so glad that you're on the call tonight because you can speak from the perspective of what's happening in the Rockaway community uh, as many mothers uh, in my district and all across um, Black communities here in the state of New York uh, are faced with uh, poor pregnancy outcomes. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing here specifically on the Rockaway Peninsula to all of our panelists and to all of our viewers, 10.3% uh, uh, of the Rockaway Peninsula's babies experience a late, uh, or mothers, excuse me, experience late or no prenatal care to begin mm -hmm. with. As it relates to preterm births, 11.3% of the babies who are born here on the Rockaway Peninsula are born uh, via preterm birth. And mm -hmm. so those are the, the, the staggering statistics that are impacting our mothers, our children, our families, but most importantly, our ability as a people to reproduce. And so it's really important that we have the supports uh, and, and the resources for our mothers to give birth in safe spaces, um, that we have the supports and resources for a healthy and safe reproductive health. But Brooke touched on this when she shared her story. Mm -hmm. We need doctors that are culturally responsive and listen to the needs of Black mothers, mm -hmm. listen to the needs of folks who are in these predicaments, but also have empathy and understanding when mothers when families have questions or concerns. We don't need doctors who pre-prescribe our socioeconomic circumstances and therefore treat us differently. We need doctors that understand these issues holistically and completely. And so we're gonna be working towards that end. And I'm so grateful for tonight's discussion as we wrap up um, March's segment of our Women's History Month uh, celebrations uh, out of our office. And so having this really tough, touchy, uh, but resource-based discussion is so critical. I know that, uh, and I'll make an announcement about our uh, continued uh, Women's History Month programming uh, this, you know, this month and, and going forward, but I definitely want to acknowledge and just touch on how important it is to recognize um, this discussion, recognize the issues that we're facing here, but also thank all of the amazing panelists um, who hail from Queens and or service um, folks in the Queens area, including in my district. I thank you immensely um, for being on the call tonight. Um, and I, I appreciate it greatly. Um, I am thankful and I'm getting ready to take some questions and answers um, from our live audiences who are watching here on YouTube, uh, who are watching on Facebook uh, and who are watching on a variety of platforms uh, all across um, you know, our spaces. And for folks who missed tonight, you will be able to catch uh, our discussion, our community conference discussion on maternal health and reproductive justice on our YouTube channel at Khalil Anderson, as well as on our social media pages at Khalil Anderson. So I'm really, really excited about that. I'm gonna take a few questions from our audiences and then I'm gonna dive into what we're doing on this issue in the state's budget. So team, uh, I wanna see if we can pull up some questions along the bottom. Let me thank uh, our backstage staff uh, who have been critical uh, in making sure tonight's program went well. Uh, Christina Cover, uh, William Bow, and Monet Schultz uh, who are backstage helping uh, make sure that we are getting everybody's questions in uh, and making sure every, the program flows successfully tonight. So we have a question from Isabella. Ms. Summers, can you read that question from Isabella? Yes. How can we ensure that mothers get the paid time they need to breastfeed post-delivery? A great question. Very great question. Let's hear from one of our panelists. Important. Can you I, am not, I, I, I don't quite understand the question because typically as an obstetrician, we try to be able to meld women's professional lives along with breastfeeding as opposed to, am I inferring that, you, that, that the, the questioner wants time off to breastfeed or make- I think, yeah, my understanding, uh, Doc, I, I think my understanding, uh, uh, Dr. Mandeville, uh, of this question is, is there 
an opportunity for paid time off uh, for folks to breastfeed post delivery. I'm not too particular with the labor law on that, but we can certainly look into it. I, our goal has been, if that's the best way, first of all, breastfeeding has benefits that I could stand here all night and, and offer you. So we're all on that page. But my, what I'm asking is, are we talking about women who do not want to go back into the workforce to breastfeed? Or it, typically what we do in, our, in the profession is try to encourage women to, inc to incorporate breastfeeding into their lives, which include their typical inclination to go back to work. So I'm not quite understanding the question. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I might be able to speak to that. I think, um, she also, I think she also, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I think she also added a, an amendment to her question on our YouTube channel uh, as well. Looks like mothers have to return to work too soon. I think that's what she's saying. Yeah. yeah Let me yeah. let you touch on that. Um, I would like to speak to that. So I believe um, it depends on where you work and if you receive mm -hmm. um, the FMLA, family medical um, leave. And it goes for the state of New York, I believe it is 12 weeks. And 12 weeks kind of, you know, if you're um, breastfeeding exclusively, that's only about three months. And at three months, the babies are, are very young. And for mothers that definitely want to breastfeed exclusively, it means that they cannot go back to work unless they're able to bring their child to work and, and breastfeed. So um, I think maybe um, that question speaks to whether or not there can be a revision um, similar to some other countries where mothers can have a full um, year of time off. So I guess it's about gauging how long that would be and then advocating for, you know, how long we think it should be, not should be, but that um, can be afforded to a mother to exclusively breastfeed. Because um, for people that are not familiar, it's around the clock. You know, it used to be every couple of hours that babies were breastfeeding. We see babies that breastfeed every 30 minutes. <laughs> So um, it does take a lot. Um, so I think it would be revisiting that. And Isabella, you could take charge of that. We, we encourage people to, to really look into to legislation and, and advocate for these changes. And I, I couldn't help uh, Brooke to acknowledge baby Jackson in the background sounding super excited uh, about tonight's discussion. Uh, Jackson is Brooke Lugo's son. Yes, he tried to join the call several times. He's my rainbow baby. They say after the storm, there's a rainbow of hope. So he is my rainbow baby that I had after my loss. And, we, and we'd love to hear him happy and healthy in the background. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Brooke, for breaking that down. And I think uh, you wanted to jump in. Can you hear me? I think we got a little bit of a lag on my side. Miss mm -hmm. Summers, can can um, Dr. Hutchison hear me? Oh, I'm sorry, I can hear you. Uh, no, okay. I, she, um, Brooke Brooke responded, so she she answered. Her response was what I would have said. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, and then uh, Isabella has a second question around um, the fact that she's a postpartum nurse and wanted to know. Uh, does most insurance cover OT therapy? Yes, they do. Um, so we, we we do have patients who, you know, if they come in and they have back pain, those are, you know, that's definitely covered. Those those phys physical um, dysfunctions are covered. They come with decor veins, which is the, the thumbs are, are painful or carpal tunnel syndrome, numbness and tingling from positioning the baby. Um, and they do also pay for, moms who have issues with pelvic um, pelvic floor dysfunction they do cover those stuff where they teach them how to to strengthen those muscles to decrease complaints about being you know in your incontinence or even prolapse and that kind of stuff so yes those services are covered yeah thank you so much for that dr hunters and i really appreciate you just clarifying that and um to my team, let's uh, definitely stay in touch with Isabella here. She has a lot of critical questions, and I'm sure she's a constituent um, who wants to be connected to one of the amazing uh, groups and organizations who are on the call tonight. Let me take one more question uh, from the audience. 
uh, and then and then I'll jump into the budget and what we're doing on this issue in the state's budget. All right, Ms. Summers, do we have any other questions from the audiences, both on YouTube and on Facebook, who are watching tonight's community conference live, where we're talking about uh, Black maternal health and reproductive justice um, for our communities all across the 31st Assembly District, uh, all across the city and state. So I'm really excited um, that we have such great panelists. All right, we got a question from uh, our uh, Facebook team. What role do you play in the fourth trimester? Um, if we can get one of my team members to just clarify the question from the constituent that we're sharing over um, so that our team can be able to. OK, we're grabbing that one from our Zoom team. Let I can speak to that. Um, I think traditionally the fourth trimester they talk about is um, the postpartum um, time. So I know for several of the organizations here, well, I feel a few of us had mentioned that um with the doula services there are postpartum doulas available that are able to provide um support with um uh childhood education lactation um and just overall emotional um support um after after birth which is considered the fourth trimester and for ot um you know unfortunately we we do have a a, a strong role in early intervention so and i find that you know, I worked, I worked there for 25 years and somehow they weren't often referred to have early um, childhood services. And we know that, you know, it's really beneficial for mom to be exposed to those services, especially if the, the children are premature or they're sick or have some form of developmental delay or something like that. So that's also where we come into play. Um, and we do this oftentimes in their homes. You know, we do home care in that sense. Um, some parents prefer to go to a center, but there are different ways in which the service can be, be accessed or utilized. So yes, we do play a role in the fourth or, you know, <laughs> like Brooke says, the, the postpartum stage of. Um, which is so critical because a lot of people don't acknowledge that fourth trimester, if you will, that period in which um, there's so much uh, uh, emotional uh, pain uh, that many women, mothers, families are facing. And so we have to make sure that we intervene and we get supports and resources um, to to that mother and to that family. So I thank you, um, Brooke, for touching on that, as well as uh, Dr. Hutchins, Hutchinson for, for touching on uh, how critical those pieces are. I have one question um, from a constituent from our uh, Zoom audience. Over two decades ago, I had the good fortune to have Dr. Mandeville as the OBGYN who successfully delivered my two beautiful daughters in some high risk circumstances. I suspect that this was before some of the research on the disparities that we are discussing tonight. I am ever thankful for my good fortune to have such excellent care. And I hope that legislation and policy that we are discussing tonight makes this kind of care available to more of my sisters and their families. So that's really powerful to hear um, from a constituent. I know Dr. Mandeville had to jump, um, but it's so important to hear from constituents when they do find care that is adequate and resources that is adequate, uh, and they do have good experiences because women uh, and families are often always looking for people and individuals uh, who, uh, who can no, be- yeah, come down here, so, um, because you're going to- Oh, sorry. It can be the most- uh, validated and so we need that validation which is so important does anybody want to comment any of our panelists want to comment before i jump into the budget stuff uh and then conclude for tonight uh on what it's like to obtain care um from uh folk who are um like dr mandeville as discussed by this constituent someone that they can trust and provide a good review for any one of our panelists yeah, and I, I will share the sentiments with Dr. Mandeville, although he had to leave. But um, we know that care that's trusted is more effective across the board uh, for people. And so it, making sure that 
who we get care from are people that we can trust. And, we, and, and that's why going out into trusted uh, venues where people uh, look like you and, and people uh, may be a, aware of the different cultural nuances and, and all those kinds of things is important. So definitely having care from a trusted individual is, is, is more effective. And, and it enhances care and enhances the patient's responsiveness to care, response to care. And it, it just it enhances the entire experience. And so people end up getting better care and doing um, well uh, when they can trust their uh, practitioner or trust their, the, the people that are in the healthcare system that are giving them that care. A safe and healthy environment, Dr. Frazier, uh, is a part of our recipe to ensure that there's a safe and healthy pregnancy and safe and healthy family and of course safe and healthy baby. So I really appreciate you, Dr. Frazier, just validating this constituent uh, in her assessment of, of Dr. Mandeville, but also to a larger scale, the assessment for us to ensure that we have practitioners that we can trust. And that's so important. So as, we, as folks may know, uh, we are uh, waist deep in negotiating a historic uh, state's budget, uh, which is technically due at midnight, but we are uh, a little ways away from uh, agreeing on a budget uh, to help uh, ensure that all the programs uh, and resources that we need around this issue and subject matter are fully funded through the next year. Uh, and that's really important. So we're, we're waist deep in those discussions and they'll be happening. Uh, they're happening now. Uh, as I return briefly um, from Albany, and they'll be happening all throughout the week and weekend uh, until we get to where we need to be. Um, but some of the critical things that are in this year's budget that are so pertinent to the issue that we're talking about right now is uh, when we passed our budget resolution just two weeks ago in the assembly, um, we included the expansion of postpartum coverage through the Medicaid program, which is so critical um, to what we're talking about now when we're talking about that fourth um, trimester. It would increase the period um, from 60 days to an entire year. Um, it takes time for mothers, for families, for children to recover, um, you know, in that moment. And so extending that postpartum coverage in the Medicaid program would help us cut down that maternal mortality rate that we talk about so much, particularly in the black community. It's, it's no secret that we rank uh, among the highest <laughs> in New York State um, around this issue. And so we're going to continue to push to ensure that the governor keeps that uh, in the budget and ensures um, that we continue to fund and support our mothers who otherwise could not afford, but also mothers across the spectrum um, to have access to postpartum coverage and care uh, through Medicaid, which is so important, so important. I'm also excited that um, elements of postpartum care, uh, as well as um, expansion of the Medicaid uh, cap, the global cap, uh, as well as the rates in which Medicaid pays uh, to its vendors are all um, being uh, increased uh, for the first time in, in over a decade to the latter. Uh, and so that's important because it'll allow mothers to have expansive options uh, and coverage because the reimbursement rates are so, so low um, with Medicaid. And so this will expand access to care. But I know that I have colleagues like uh, Assemblywoman Jackson, who I thank so much for being on the call, that are actively working um, to address maternal depression screenings, uh, to work to address the social worker aspect um, that many mothers and families need and all of those things and all of the funding for programs and nonprofits who do that important work um, are, are, are making its way through the state's budget, um, which is so important. So I'm grateful um, that we are prioritizing this issue, not just prioritizing it as a, a reproductive justice issue, but also a racial justice issue, because it's important for us to acknowledge um, that Black women uh, stand a chance to, uh, more likely to have more high-risk pregnancies uh, and less access to adequate uh, trusted care. And so we have to work to expand that. I'm excited um, that we will be continuing our Women's History Month programming um, next month. 
uh, with our Women of Distinctions Award Ceremonies on April 16th. We're focusing on across generations, just like we did last year, part two, where we're having these intimate discussions literally across generations. We're speaking to aunts, uncles, or excuse me, aunts, aunties, uh, mothers, sisters, uh, and nieces about the critical, critical work that women do um, to keep our communities healthy, safe, uh, and involved. So let me just bring the panelists back on um, to thank them so very much. Dr. Rumley, uh, thank you so much. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Hutchinson, of course, uh, you know how I feel about you, Brooke. I appreciate you and all the work that you do in the neighborhood. Uh, and Dr. Frazier, um, thank you all for being on tonight's call. Do you all have any closing remarks um, before I close out tonight's super successful and information-rich panel discussion? I just, um, I, I thank you all for having me. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk um, on behalf of Dr. Mandeville as well. I want to just encourage us to advocate for our health. I think we have to take it in our own hands and advocate for that at different parts of the, the spectrum, whether it's training the next generation of healthcare professionals, whether it's educating uh, our communities uh, about their health, or whether we're just advocating with our, working with our assembly man, members to advocate for that. So I just wanna thank you for, for this forum so that we can discuss this important topic. Thank you so much, Dr. Frazier. And to Dr. Mandeville as well, gotta make sure I shout him out too. I know you had to jump, but we appreciate his contributions and making my constituents feel comfortable uh, and safe and trusted. Uh, that's so critical. So thank you, Dr. Frazier. Uh, and to the Arthur Ashe Institute, to the amazing work that you guys do. Our other panelists, do you all have any closing remarks? Dr. Hutchinson, followed by Dr. Rumley. And um, it, I, I, I think the panelists were awesome. I, I think I've made some connections here. Um, just want to reinforce the importance of you know occupational therapy, especially in the postpartum phase. If your child has, you know, any delays or, or is sick or you know issues that could affect how they um, progress um, through through their growth, that we want to have parents seek the services out because too often they don't seek it, and they and and when they do get it, it's oftentimes, in my opinion, a little bit um, late. So, mm -hmm. want to promote occupational therapy services. Thank you so much, Dr. Hutchinson, and I have to make my way over to where you are, because that dining room looks beautiful. Sunday dinner <laughs> must be a blast. <laughs> no, <there's... laughs> Appreciate you. Uh, Dr. Rumley from the QCPC. I Dr. feel oh, energized um, knowing that there is this cross section of professionals that have the same passion and commitment to addressing the disparities that we see in our communities regarding maternal mortality and morbidity, infant mortality and morbidity. So it's just, uh, it's exciting to know that you're Thank not you. That's it. And it's teamwork and it's partnership. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, even as my staff make sure that your organization and uh, website for resources is on our screen, uh, I want to also acknowledge the work that uh, our office is doing uh, to fight for more resources in this area, um, particularly with our local um, healthcare facilities and treatment spaces for, for women. We, my staff was out, my team was out today at the grand opening of a women's center, first of its kind on the Rockaway Peninsula, uh, which will have uh, comprehensive access to health support services for women uh, that run the gamut. Uh, right on 105th Street uh, and, and Shorefront Park, we're in the Rockway. So we're really excited that we got a chance to be a part of uh, that ribbon cutting and, and, and opening because it really opens up more opportunities and more resources for our families, our women uh, and children on the Rockway Peninsula. But we're also fighting to make sure that we fully fund the renovation of the St. John's uh, Labor and Delivery Award, um, which mm -hmm. has not been upgraded or updated uh, in, in several decades. Um, this will help ensure that mothers on the Rockaway Peninsula and all across the district, quite frankly, 
can give birth in a healthy and safe space uh, and a space that they can trust uh, and a space that they can feel uh, is, is supportive uh, during their pregnancy. Let me close with uh, Brooke Smith. Take it away, Brooke. Thank you, Dr. Rumley. Take it away, Brooke. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, thank you to all the amazing panelists for being here. Um, thank you for all the information that you are offering to our communities. Um, thank you, Assembly Member Anderson and your team for creating a space mm -hmm. to have these tough conversations. They are definitely, like you said, very tough conversations. So thank you for creating a space to open the door and, and have the conversations. And I believe with you know, great elected officials like you, our great state of New York will be able to stand behind these causes and hopefully we'll be able to start to improve outcomes in our country. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for all the critical, critical emotional support, financial support, Brooke, and to all of the folks who are on this call, mm -hmm. resources that you provide to our community and to our constituents. We thank you all so very much uh, and we thank, um, of course, uh, everyone uh, in our audience who participated tonight. I'm going to close out with some words, but say uh, goodbye and thank you for now, because I'm going to see you all in the community doing the amazing work and be supporting mm -hmm. you um, to our amazing panelists who are on the call uh, tonight. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, ladies, so much. Thank you. Awesome. 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 And Miss Summers, you stick by because we want to make sure we give the constituents who are on tonight, um, some of the critical updates um, from our district. I always like to close with a district update, uh, Ms. Summers. Uh, I always like to close with a uh, district update on what we're working on as an office. I talked about the Women's History Month Across Generations Women of Distinction Award Ceremony, which is taking place April 16th. I also want to talk about the MTA Queens Bus redesign plan, virtual workshops uh, will be taking place as soon as May. If you want to have your voices heard about the uh, redesign of our bus networks all across the district, you should stay tuned to our social media pages, uh, as well as our email blasts and physical mailer um, that we send out across the district um, to discuss this critical, critical bus redesign plan. We want to hear your voices, so make sure you guys tune in. Uh, on April 14th, we are having our Bartlett Dairy Job Information Session. There are over 70 jobs plus coming to the Springfield Gardens community of the 31st Assembly District. And we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to apply for those jobs, get information on those jobs, uh, and get prepared for those jobs that are coming down the pipeline. So we're really, really, really excited about that. And lastly, uh, in spring of 2022, so excited that the family fitness program that myself and my city council colleague have fully funded over the next uh, three to four years, our Wise Walking Warriors, our tennis program, everything is coming back in spring 2022. So we're excited that Springfield Park will be hosting our Wise Walking Warriors and tennis program this spring, as well as, it, uh, as an extension to the Rockaway Peninsula. We're so excited. Beach 30th Street will be the host this year. And that's starting next month, April. So we're really excited. And I'm asking everybody to stay tuned in to my social media. Follow me at Khalil Anderson on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube, uh, as well as on uh, Twitter. Uh, and make sure that that space uh, is safe for all of, all of our folks. And so we will have a multitude of different programs, uh, a multitude of ways that you guys can plug in. But one thing I always like to leave the constituents is, uh, with is, is this. My office serves as a hand up, not a handout. We want to actively work to connect people to resources, to services, to help improve their quality of life. We also want to help ensure that we're, we're dismantling systems of racism and systemic oppression. And tonight's discussion is so critical because we're talking about a system that works differently for two different types, for two of the same folks, humans. A system that works differently for black mothers than it does for white mothers. Uh, and the like. And so we want to help dismantle a system um, that does that. And we do that by passing critical legislation, getting information and resources to you all, but making sure that we hold government accountable to its commitment to ensure people uh, have a safe and healthy life. So I'm excited to be here on tonight's call. Uh, I'm excited to ensure uh, that we prioritize women 
uh, as we uh, as we close the month of March for Women's History Month, we also have to acknowledge that women are our champions all throughout, not just in the month of March, but all throughout the year. We must celebrate, uplift, and empower our sisters in this time. So I want to thank all of our audiences across our platforms for being on tonight. And I thank uh, Ms. Summers uh, and the rest of our team uh, for being on tonight's call. I want to thank uh, my chief of staff, Carl, as well as Ms. Culver, uh, Mr. Bow, and Ms. Schultz for putting on tonight, which was a successful program. We will see you next month, April, for our monthly, monthly community conference. We look forward to, to, to next month's topic, and we look forward to seeing you all tune in. Thank you so much, and let's continue to fight to ensure our community is the best community, the 31st Assembly District. Thank you very much, everyone.